Thank you uh, for choosing to spend this portion of the afternoon attending this lecture. This lecture is sponsored by Westmont's Department of Political Science and is made possible because of generous funding by the John Templeton Foundation through a grant uh, from the Institute for Humane Studies. And we're very grateful for that support. You'll notice that on each of your seats, there's a short survey to be completed after the lecture, not before, I saw a couple of you earlier. Um, <laughs> Uh, so please, before you leave, um, complete those. You can just leave them on the little table with the plant on it over here. First, I wanted to say a word about Constitution Day. Uh, when I was publicizing this event, I received a message from a colleague who, says, who said to me, how is it that I have lived for 42 years and this is the first I've heard of Constitution Day? And he blamed Aaron Sorkin for not mentioning it enough in the West Wing, uh, for those of you who are fans of that show. But I thought that I would at least note that Constitution Day is celebrated on September 17th, which fall on a weekend this year, but it is the day on which we celebrate the signing of the US Constitution. For many years, it was known as Citizenship Day, uh, since 1952, it was known as Citizenship Day, which is celebrating those who had attained citizenship. And then there was legislation passed in 2004 in which it was um, uh, renamed, or at least additionally named, Constitution Day. And that piece of legislation in 2004 then also added the requirement that the heads of all federal agencies were required to provide educational materials to all of their employees about the US Constitution and all educational institutions that accept federal funding were also required to run some kind of educational uh, event related to the US Constitution. So in other words, every educational institution is supposed to do this if they receive federal funds. So in other words, it's an occasion when the government requires everyone to think about the Constitution for someone like me who studies constitutional law, it's also known as the best day ever. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Derek Muller, Associate Professor um, at Pepperdine University School of Law. Uh, Professor Muller and I have two institutions in common in our background. I am a, a, an alumnus of Pepperdine University's Seaver College. Um, he attended law at the University of Notre Dame uh, school of Law, which if you know my background, you know that I went to graduate school at Notre Dame. I won't bring up how our football season is going other, uh, you know, you know, other than to you know, say, moment of silence, move on. At Pepperdine, Professor Muller teaches in the areas of election law, civil procedure, complex litigation, administrative law, and evidence. We're not going to hear about all of those today. We're going to focus on election law. His research and writing do focus on election law, particularly federalism and the role of states in the administration of elections. His work has appeared in numerous law review journals, including the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy and the Election Law Journal. He is a frequently consulted expert on election law. So many times if you're reading an article in a major newspaper about election law, you'll see his name mentioned as a consultant. He's also an author fairly regularly of op-eds in major US newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. Professor Mueller's commitment to proper procedure and accountability extends to his personal life. He's one of the only people I know who every year on January 1st posts his New Year's resolutions for the coming year on social media and then also posts his scorecard for the previous year's New Year's resolutions, <laughs> which is pretty impressive. And I'm happy to report that this year, after three, three years, he's going to finally be able to cross off having surfed. <laughs> Professor Muller, it's a pleasure to have you at Westmont, and we're looking forward to hearing from you today. We'll hear from his, his comments, and then there'll be time for question and answer afterwards. Please join me in welcoming Professor Muller. <laughs> Special thank you to Professor Covington for inviting me out here. There's no better form of accountability than doing it very publicly in a very public place and then holding yourself accountable with a high failure rate year after year, but I do what I can. Um, 
I, I hope to provide some description about elections in the United States and the framers uh, designed system that may serve as a jumping off point for us today uh, to think why we have the system we have in place today um, and how defensible it is. Given that a great deal of attention is being paid to this year's presidential election, um, as it has perhaps every four years, we think this one we pay the most attention to, claims perhaps unprecedented about the brokenness of our system, it might be good to look at how it developed. And not as much driven by a central thesis as perhaps opening a conversation about our expectations for elections in the United States uh, and how they were informed by the wisdom in this founding document. I'll wander through the Constitution's history uh, in the process. Now, there's a really good reason why we celebrate the Constitution. Uh, we believe that we, the people, are sovereign. We are in charge of the United States of America. We dictate its rules. No individual or other body holds that power. And the Constitution is the enduring expression of our decision to delegate some of that power that we have as the sovereign citizens to another body to run the day-to-day -day affairs of our government. It's not the only way we could have done so, and it's not the only way we have done so. For starters, we live in a state with its own constitution, another separate document that we the people have delegated some of our power to another body to run the day-to-day -day affairs of that government. Additionally, prior to the Constitution, we the people delegated some of that power through other documents, including, among other things, the Articles of Confederation, albeit more indirectly and more imperfectly. Indirectly, because the assemblies in the several states were the ones who ratified it, not we the people directly. The Constitution, you see, was submitted to the people in the several states for ratification. By popular election, we in the several states voted to ratify it. And imperfectly, because as you probably know, the Articles of Confederation did not last very long. Uh, while the colonies had originally worried that we would have too much power in a centralized government that might become oppressive, the Articles were simply too weak to achieve their desired ends. So today we celebrate, well, today a couple of days late because of Saturday, September 17th. And that's not the date that the Constitution was ratified or took effect. We celebrate its birthday, the day that uh, the many framers, most of them at least, who contemplating it over that hot summer in Philadelphia in 1787, gathered together and signed their names in the document. At that point, it was actually an open question about whether or not this Constitution would ever be ratified. Uh, it would take months for the Constitution to be circulated among the several states, uh, for those states to hold popular votes for its ratification, for the debate to play out in local newspapers and town halls. Uh, and in the newspapers is Publius, the pseudonym for John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison, vociferously defended this document and this new form of government as skeptics sought to bring it down. State after state saw it, considered it for a popular vote among their enfranchised citizens, slowly approved it, and it finally took effect in 1788. And all the states from that original confederation ultimately would ratify it. Now, the great debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists over this new constitution varied. Most common was the concern about the absence of a Bill of Rights, but that was really driven by the larger concern. Would this new centralized government be too powerful? We are all familiar of some of the hallmarks of this new form of government. We could probably recite some of them from our high school civics class. This was a government designed to secure individual liberty. But we, the people, necessarily gave that government some power to secure that liberty. How to hold this new government in check when it had been given such awesome powers, powers to regulate, to tax, to wage war, the first trait was that it would be a government of enumerated powers. Congress could only operate in the limited and enumerated areas of power granted to it by that document. The same holds true for the executive and for the judiciary. That would help secure individual liberty by preventing government from doing whatever it wished. And this would further be constrained by the Bill of Rights, which expressly prevented Congress from acting in certain domains of individual liberty. And what the federal government could not do would be left to the states or to the people. The states, the more responsive, smaller bodies of government, the people, the ultimate sovereign. The second trait is that it would be marked by the separation of powers. 
derived from the works of Montesquieu, power would not be concentrated in any single body, but would be distributed across branches. These branches would slow down the wheels of government, require greater deliberation and consensus, and result in jealous checks and guards against one another. That would also help protect individual liberty, because government could not so easily accumulate power. All well and good, and likely quite familiar to many in this room. But who would serve in that government? How should this new, more powerful government be formed? The Constitution has a lot to say about elections, a lot. It's probably not the thing we think of when we first think about the document, or indeed as one of its defining characteristics, but just as important as what, to the framers as what the government could do is how that government should be formed. The Articles of Confederation, you see, had a pretty narrow and simple form of government. State legislatures selected individuals who would serve in Congress. At that time, Congress was a single house. Congress would elect a president, but that word doesn't mean what you think it means. It was a person who just presided over the Congress, presided over the meetings, held little power uh, beyond anything in, that he was given as a member of that assembly in Congress. Foreign diplomats would not meet with this president, but would meet with the Congress as a whole. Congress voted as a state. Whether you had two delegates or seven delegates, your state received one vote. Acts of Congress required unanimity, and this was fairly concentrated power, right? A single chamber of government that controlled everything, but it was also very limited power. There was not need to have much in the way of governing elections. It's very simple. The state legislatures had complete control over their delegation in Congress, and that one delegation could stop any law because unanimity was required. So the new government under the Constitution would look a little different. It would have much greater power and many more responsibilities. So who would be in power in that government mattered greatly. It is a reason why Publius's Federalist Number 51, James Madison's influential and lasting description of the form of government lingers with us to this day. When we have empowered a mighty government to do many things, controlling that government is an important task. You must first permit that government to control the governed, but you must also have it control itself, Publius explained. And while the separation of powers was one way of doing that, that could not be the only way. It was not sufficient to address the concerns that a powerful government might move unchecked against individual liberty. The Constitution then contains many, many provisions about how government officials are elected. Some are so routine, we forget about them. Others are often lost among the more significant things that occur in this document. But they are not add-ons or afterthoughts. They are essential to this form of a functioning government that would be controlled by we the people for elections are principally the means that we, the people, have of controlling the government. Indeed, if one took a moment to review the text of the Constitution, you'd find a nearly obsessive focus on elections. Consider Article I, the longest article, which describes what Congress's role is. Article, or Section 1 has a brief sentence granting all legislative power to Congress. Section 2 describes how the House is elected, who is qualified to be elected, how many representatives each state gets, and how elections take place when vacancies occur. It creates the census, an actual enumeration of the population of each state for the purpose of allocating members of the House of Representatives to the several states every 10 years to figure out how many members for the House of Representatives should be elected from each of the several states. The larger the state's population, the more members the House gets. Section three describes how the Senate is elected, who is qualified to be elected, how elections take place when vacancies occur. Section four empowers Congress to regulate the time, place, and manner of holding elections, and in the absence thereof, the states may act. Section five empowers each house to be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members. Section six conditions the service of members of Congress for the time for which they are elected from serving in other offices. It is a seemingly endless list of rules governing elections. And mosquitoes in my face. <laughs> <laughs> but given the design of the framers constitution, this makes sense. Who ran the government and how they took office mattered greatly. The form of government itself mattered. Two houses of Congress are not simply a compromise to appease the large and small states. 
It was also a way of slowing down government, requiring greater deliberation and consensus before laws could be enacted that might infringe upon our liberties. And these two houses would also be elected differently to reflect different interests. The members of the House faced two-year terms, meaning high accountability to the people and the opportunity for popular support or retraction of that support if things changed quickly in the popular sentiment. The Senate was more deliberative. It was not elected directly by the people, but indirectly through the people's state legislatures, which selected their senators. The six-year staggered terms of the Senate provided greater insulation from popular sentiment. It's not clear that the more direct democracy or the more indirect election would be better. Each had its faults. Direct democracy was more prone to the exaggerated passions of the people. Indirect democracy meant less accountability to the people. Direct democracy meant that corrupt individuals might sway a gullible public. Indirect democracy meant that state legislatures might choose their political cronies. But the hope was that mixing the forms of election and service might result in a balanced and stable form of government. It was not entirely clear how elections should be run. After all, this American experiment was quite new. The Greek city-states, the English House of Commons, a few Swiss cantons were hardly sufficient evidence about how elections ought to take place. The colonies had uh, experimented with varying degrees of democracy, some more direct, some less direct, and different degrees of the enfranchisement of their citizens. Who would be eligible to vote in these federal elections in the grand experiment of the House of Representatives? The framers just decided to leave that question to the states. Whoever was qualified to vote in the state elections for the lower chamber of the state legislature, those people would be qualified to vote in the federal elections for the House of Representatives. When would they take place? Would members of the House come from single member districts or two from a district or in statewide elections? States could decide that too, but Congress might override them if they so desired. It was a balancing act, not too much power at the outset for Congress, but not unfettered control over elections for the states. The House of Representatives was also designed to represent the people, we the people, most directly. But how many representatives should each state receive? At least one, no doubt, no matter how small the state. But how to allocate the rest? Bigger states should receive more representation, but bigger how? By land area? I mean, perhaps not, but control over property was one of the most significant elements in the framers' concerns. The liberty to own and possess and control private property was paramount, and the government that could take away private property or regulate that private property would be the most problematic. And so there was thought that wealth or land might be a better approximation about which state should have the most representation. Total population of the states, perhaps, would be represented in the House. Representatives, after all, represent we the people, but they represent some set of interests, too. You know, there are competing views at the founding about what representatives are supposed to do, most succinctly summarized by Edmund Burke. Are representatives just supposed to be responsive to the voters who might throw them out of office every two years? Or are they supposed to make decisions based upon the common good and the interests of all those around them, perhaps to their peril when the election cycle comes in two years. They're theoretically supposed to represent the interests of everyone, including women and children and immigrants who couldn't vote, but it'd be very hard to say they were representing the interests of felons. And in fact, one of the more notorious provisions of this Constitution also arose partially out of this theory of representation, the three-fifths clause. For purposes of apportioning members of the House of Representatives among the several states, deciding how many representatives each state gets after the census, slaves would count as three-fifths of a whole person. To be a bit wry, this was a good deal for the slaves. Far worse to be counted as five-fifths of a person and give additional slaveholding uh, rights to those in the South. But it also reflected one of the more controversial points of the House of Representatives. No one could seriously claim that those elected officials for the House of Representatives in the South were representing some portion of the interests of the slaves, of three-fifths of the slave population. Instead, this apportionment in the House represented some other theory, not direct representation of the total population plus three-fifths of the slave population, but something like wealth or something like the power and influence within the particular states, partially measured by total population, partially measured by other factors. 
And while the three-fifths clause permitted taxation to be allocated to the states in part based on the slave population, this provision was never really used. The clause ended up being principally about empowering the South in elections. This leads inevitably to another question about who the representatives are supposed to represent, us, all of us, or those who vote for them. And they're challenging questions wrapped up in decisions about how we create this system of governance, ones I am not equipped to answer today, and ones the framers were not equipped to answer when they were constructing the House of Representatives, except to note that they are lurking in the background in the details about how the framers conceived of elections. This was a known issue in England, and it was a known issue in the House. This rather convoluted or confusing view of representation in the House can be made much simpler when one considers the Senate. There was no allocation, no counting that needed to happen because everyone gets two senators. There was no confusing question about who would participate in the elections because the state legislature participated in the elections. The states might have different interests than the people and the sovereign entities in those states, the states themselves, would seek representation the best way for the states to be assured of representation would be through their legislators who were elected by we the people. And the Senate was a form of indirect democracy, which when mixed with the direct democracy of the House would hopefully represent the mixed interests within the United States. Now I know what you're thinking. This lecture included Trump and Clinton in the title and when are we going to get there? <laughs> and wasn't the three-fifths clause overturned after the Civil War and what happened in the Senate? And this is all coming, I promise. You see. The form of government in the House and the Senate begins to inform how we elect the president. But today, the election of the president is the dominant focus of our elections in popular culture. Article two is dramatically smaller in scope than Article I because the framers anticipated that the executive power would be much less than the legislative power. The legislative power was paramount. Extensive discussion about it was going to require an extensive discussion within the Constitution. And what might happen if this new executive were to be king, a monarch, a tyrant? It would be no better to trade one tyrant in George III, the framers reasoned, for another in this new president. The executive's role, therefore, was going to be somewhat limited. He would have some significant power, the opportunity to veto legislation, which could be overridden by two-thirds of vote of both houses of Congress. But that veto power is not as significant as you might believe if you understand the framers' perspective. So the executive could not act on his own, could only stop or check what Congress otherwise might do. If the risk is that Congress is going to overreach and infringe upon individual liberty, the presidential veto was simply a way of assuring even greater protection of that liberty. Still greater consensus from the members of government would be required before any laws could be enacted. So who would become this new president? Who would entertain foreign ambassadors and perform the kinds of functions kings did in other countries? This was a trickier proposition. One idea was the popular election of the president, but this was quickly rejected for a variety of reasons. For starters, empowering the people to elect members of the House was one thing. Empowering them also to elect this president, this single executive head of the country, was another. The people, many framers worried, would be susceptible to rash decision making. They would be liable to deceptions. They would lack the capacity to judge, are the statements made by the framers. Further, the states were administering these elections individually. It would be a massive undertaking to organize a single national election among all of these states together simultaneously and aggregating their votes for a single candidate. Others suggested that Congress could select a president. But this was met somewhat coolly, too. The president was supposed to act as a check upon Congress. Wouldn't it be too easy for Congress to select someone who would simply affirm its wishes? What kind of independent check would that be? Through some curious consensus, the idea of an electoral college developed. The states would choose dispassionate, intelligent individuals from each of the states. This would cure the problem of a national election, because they would occur at the state level and of excessively passionate direct democracy, because it would be an indirect form of election. Have the members of this electoral college assemble simultaneously in their respective states. Have them decide independently of the best man to serve as president. Then send them back to their homes, disband this college. How to select these electors? 
be left wholly to discretion of the state legislatures, which would decide the manner of selecting electors. Some chose the electors themselves. Others allowed popular elections in the states to select electors. It would be left, left to the states to figure that one out. How many electors would there be? In a nod to Congress, the total electors would be the total number of senators and the total number of representatives each state had. So at least three and perhaps more. After all, the Senate and the House represented the states in some way, either by geography or total population-ish. And the sum of these two seemed reasonable enough for presidential electors. It was also a way of helping protect the smaller states, uh, which had been protected through the guarantee of two senators, no matter their size, and at least one representative, no matter their size. And it would ensure fairly broad geographic support, not limited to narrow interests from one state that might have a lot of voters casting ballots for the president. In an effort to ensure broad support, a further check on this election, in this form of election, presidential candidates would need a majority of the votes of the Electoral College, not simply a plurality. If the winning candidate failed to secure a majority of the votes, the election would be sent to the House of Representatives in what was known as a contingent election. Each state gets a single vote, similar to the Continental Congress, and the House then selects the president if the electors have failed to do so, but only among the top vote-getters in the Electoral College. Initially, the framers expected this contingent election would happen quite often, and the House would have to choose the president quite regularly, but not among their own choices, among the top five options narrowed before them in the Electoral College. A further concern, though. What if, the framers worried, everyone simply showed up in their home states as electors, selected candidates from their home state, and we simply had a bunch of parochial interests, primarily out of New York or Pennsylvania or Virginia. The thought was to require electors to vote for two candidates, one of which could not be a re resident of the state where they were voting. How to get them to vote for two candidates? Create a second office. And so the office of vice president was created as a means of legitimating the point of handing out two ballots to, for every member of the Electoral College. And in fact, when you think about the role of the Vice President, it's a curious role, isn't it? Not many institutions have sort of a backup executive or somebody who acts in the absence of the executive. The Vice President would take the role of presiding over the Senate and casting votes in, the, in cases of a tie. And so having this curious responsibility in both the executive branch as a part of the presidential team and the legislative branch presiding over the Senate was a curious anomaly, but one created for this purpose of ensuring that the candidate who won the majority of the Electoral College came with broad geographic support. If the majority of electors tied for the same candidate, the same number of votes for the, the, the top vote getter, the House doesn't get five choices, the House simply picks one of those two. If there's a tie for the Vice President, then it is sent to the Senate to pick its leader. And the Constitution spells all of this out in excruciating detail. We can pause for a moment to reflect on this mixed system, rec uh, recognizing the good and the bad surrounding direct democracy. And even indirect elections, not so bad. Here the people elected their state legislatures who then chose the electors, or there might be a popular vote for electors, and the electors picked the president. There were indirect opportunities to be involved in the presidential election by the people, who would be two or three steps removed from the selection of the chief executive. They're still, however, represented in some sense. It's simply that they are more indirectly represented, and there are increased opportunities for deliberation at every stage in the process. So this beautiful document is written, it is submitted, it is ratified, and immediately problems arise in how we elect our president. Everyone agrees who's selected from the Electoral College in that first election that they want George Washington to be the president, they want John Adams to be the vice president. But as they gather together and they look at their ballots, they realize they have a problem. Because if everybody votes for George Washington and John Adams, they will receive the same number of electoral votes, that is, all of them. And then the election will be sent to the House because there is a tie, and the House must choose which one of them must become the president. So Congress realizes, or the, the Electoral College realizes this is a problem, and so some electors have to throw their votes away. They say, we will vote for George Washington and Adams, say most of them, and a few say we will vote for George Washington and someone else who is not John Adams, and that ensures that George Washington gets all of the votes, John Adams gets something less than all of the votes because a few votes are thrown away, no problems after the first election. 
should immediately raise red flags that the system is not performing as it was intended. Immediately after this, we see the rise of political parties in the United States, something that was also not anticipated by the framers. Indeed, if you've read George Washington's beautiful farewell address, he repeatedly urges the American public to avoid political parties and avoid the factionalism that will develop. But his words go unheeded. Political parties form primarily around the personalities of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson at this point in time, who are the leading candidates of their parties to serve as the next president of the United States. So in 1796, some want Adams and Thomas Pinckney as the president and vice president. Others want Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. But everyone in the Electoral College recognizes the problem. You have to vote for your presidential candidate and have a few of your electors throw their votes away for vice president. So a few of the electors vote for Adams and someone other than Thomas Pinckney, but too many of them do so. And so the first place vote getter is John Adams. The second place vote getter is his enemy, Thomas Jefferson. The third place vote getter, Thomas Pinckney. So Jefferson, as the second place vote getter, will serve as the vice president in the John Adams administration, the mortal enemy of the Federalists. This obviously is a problem. It does not exactly function as the framers intended. Indeed, the Electoral College was supposed to meet on the same day in their respective states to avoid conspiring with one another across the states. There were supposed to be independent individual deliberations occurring about who the best candidate would be, but we have long since passed that opportunity. Instead, it was inevitable that some conspiracies were going to occur. In 1800, the Jeffersonians recognized their problem. They refused to throw their votes away. And so Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr each received the most votes. They also received the same number of votes. In a tied election, the election is sent to the House of Representatives. And the Federalists in the House of Representatives, who were supporters of Adams and no supporters of Jefferson, tried to hold up this administration by insisting that they would only prefer Aaron Burr to be the next president of the United States. And so the House has to consider whether it will be Jefferson or Burr, and they're voting in blocks of individual states. And they vote, and they are unable to come up with a winner. And they vote a second time and are unable to come up with a winner. And they vote a third time, and they are unable to come up with, come up with a winner. And by the 35th ballot in the House, where they are unable to come up with a winner, <laughs> as the Federalists continue to block the efforts for Jefferson to become the president, there is finally a breakthrough in the logjam. And on the 36th ballot, Jefferson becomes the president of the United States. Uh, these are fairly vicious and vitriolic elections at the founding. They are uh, you know, reminiscent of some of the language we hear in today's debates. They are simply not the kinds that occur on Twitter. They are the kinds that occur in newspapers and in back rooms of uh, various taverns around the eastern seaboard. The system was not built for political parties. It was certainly not built for electors pledged to support a slate of candidates. It did not anticipate that there would be a singular ticket of a presidential candidate and a vice presidential candidate, regardless of the state residence of the electors. So promptly, we have the 12th Amendment. It's worth noting that the Bill of Rights and these first 10 amendments are enacted immediately following the ratification of the Constitution. This is one of the first things America did was to reform the system. Each elector gets to designate a presidential vote and a vice presidential vote to avoid the problems from the old system. Failure to secure a majority in the Electoral College means the House selects among the top three candidates. Failure to select a vice presidential candidate means the Senate picks among the top two vote-getting candidates. This was designed to cure some of the problems from the last few elections. It's worth noting some of the things that haven't changed. First, state legislatures still get to decide how to select these electors. Over time, the states gradually moved toward the popular election of presidential electors. But in 1824, several states, Delaware, Georgia, New York, South Carolina, and Vermont, didn't hold a popular election for presidential electors. The state legislature simply picked electors to cast their votes. It was also a fractured election in 1824. Andrew Jackson secures 99 electoral votes to John Quincy Adams' 84 electoral votes, but 131 were needed to win. The framers required you to have an outright majority in the Electoral College, so the election goes to the House. It would hardly be surprising that Henry Clay, who was placed in fourth in the Electoral College and the Speaker of the House, 
And as the fourth place vote getter was not among the top three that the House could consider, and a man who supported Adams and truly hated Andrew Jackson helped develop a bargain in the House to ensure that John Adams would win the presidency, even though he placed second in the Electoral College. The system did exactly what it was designed to do, and yet Jackson brought his cry of direct democracy to the people, saying that it was completely unfair that he should have lost when he received the most electoral votes. The most, but not a majority. You see, we have other forms and intervening causes in our electoral system and other opportunities for deliberation. It's why John Quincy Adams won in 1824 and why Jackson learns with some better politicking to win with an outright majority in 1828. And yet the legislatures still have the choice of electors. It is the South Carolina legislature that would choose its own electors as late as 1860, another momentous election. By the time we get to 1860, it's noted that we think Congress is the one that matters for the most part. Article one is the longest provision. We anticipate the legislature is going to have the most power. The president is simply going to be a figurehead. But this figurehead has taken on a unique role, starting from George Washington. <laughs> but note that it was the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, just his election, that prompted the southern states to secede, to file articles of secession to protect slavery and their rights as sovereign states. The president had become much more significant in this national system than we might anticipate. And that made elections for the president all the more significant. We may look at unique moments of the executive increasing power from Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War to the New Deal, to the Great Society, from the Bush administration in wartime to the Obama administration in executive orders, but that's a little different. That's the actual power of the executive up against the perceived significance of this figurehead as a national representative of all voters in the United States. Reconstruction saw some unusual presidential elections, but the Constitution would begin to address still more election law issues after the dust had settled from the Civil War. Section two of the 14th Amendment, underutilized to this day, dictates that if any state denies the right to vote to adult males except for participation in rebellion or other crime, their representation in those states in the House shall be diminished. It wasn't really used. But it was designed to provide a kind of stick for the South to ensure that the newly freed slaves, those African Americans, would be able to vote. A couple of years later, the 15th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Significantly, both the 14th and 15th Amendments grant new powers to Congress, the power to enforce those provisions, a novel expansion of federal power here in the area of elections, something beyond those original enumerated powers. And while many states, in fact, did permit non-whites to vote in elections, this guaranteed it everywhere. The 17th Amendment then altered how we elect senators. Increasingly in the late 19th and early 20th century, populism and progressivism swept the country as labor unions and farmers wanted a greater say in what was happening in government, and as state legislatures often abdicated their responsibilities, failing to select senators to send on to Washington, D.C. And in fact, the several states were just one vote shy of calling a constitutional convention before the 17th Amendment was ratified. It shifted our system of election and our mixed form of Congress into essentially two parallel tracks, where we have direct democracy for the House and direct democracy for the Senate. No more would the state legislatures have a say in how our senators were elected. The 19th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote regardless of sex. The 20th Amendment deals more subtly with transitions of presidents in office. The 22nd Amendment limits the term of office for presidential candidates to two four-year terms. The 23rd Amendment gives the District of Columbia three presidential electors. The 24th Amendment prohibits poll taxes in federal elections. The 25th Amendment deals with vacancies in the office of president, how succession or disability issues occur, and is apparently the, the uh, object of a new show fe uh, featuring Kiefer Sutherland. The 26th Amendment extends the right to vote to 18-year-olds in all elections. The 27th Amendment prohibits senators or representatives from raising their pay until an intervening election has occurred. I mean, pausing here after the Bill of Rights, the amendments that touch on elections are 14, 15, 17, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. It might be easier to name the ones I didn't mention. The 11th on the ability of states to sue in federal court, the 13th ending slavery, the 16th an in income tax, the 18th and 21st on prohibition. That's it. 
Instead, these amendments reflect an increasing change in the attitudes of the American public. They are a commitment to direct democracy, a value in the direct election of all of our representatives, and a broad commitment to enfranchisement of all citizens to the extent practicable in our republic. You know, these are not obviously good things. I say this controversially. It's emphatically true. Consider California. We are perhaps no, or the biggest fans in the country of direct democracy. But we do not vote on every law. We leave much of that job to the state legislature. Now, sure, this November, we will vote on a whopping 17 ballot initiatives this fall, direct democracy in force. But for the most part, we think it's OK to have someone else governing the day-to-day -day affairs of our democracy. It is indirect democracy. It is not direct participation. Our federal judges are not elected, even though we elect them in the states. And there's some dispute as to which one is better. Is it better to have the dispassionate judge who's going to be sentencing you without worrying about the effects that it might have on the voters this November? Or is it better to have someone who's going to be held accountable, a voice for the, representing the interests of the people when deciding these matters? Well, what does that all have to do with today? We've seen a mixed form of government and a form of government where presidential electors have potentially significant independent discretionary decision-making authority, shifting increasingly toward an expectation of direct democracy, of immediate responsiveness of our elected officials. You know, it might be a safe thing to assume, might be, that many in this room are not terribly thrilled with the two major presidential candidates who have won their nominations of the Republican and Democratic Party, whether it's the demographic trends of you being young Americans or of evangelicals or whatever sort of socioeconomic demographic you want to put into it. Uh, generally speaking, the polls indicate that you are probably not a big fan of either candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, we have removed slowly many of the filters that the fil fr framers put in place because we've moved toward this fairly homogenous view about how elections ought to occur. Consider, for instance, presidential primaries. These are a novel creation out of the 1960s and 1970s in particular. We at one point had intermediaries where political parties, the seasoned partisan officials numbering in the hundreds of thousands across the states, who were looking out for the long-term interests of their party, long-term interests of establishing broad coalitions of voters who might support the platform of their presidential candidate. But over time, we thought that those elite, stuffy interests of a few hundred people were not the right way to go. Instead, we, the people, should be directly involved in selecting our presidential nominees. That results in fewer institutions, less power for political parties, and more direct power for we, the people. When we hold elections this November, each of the 50 states will directly select a slate of presidential electors. This, of course, could still be left to the state legislature, potentially saving us a lot of time and exhaustion as the state legislature could pick whatever candidates it wanted. You see, it would be the first way to change our system, to remove the power we have to select our presidential electors. That sounds like a dramatic departure from the way things work, but they have not always been this way. For many years, up until the 1860s, state legislatures did so regularly. Indeed, in 1876, the state of Colorado was newly admitted to the United States. And the state of Colorado said, wow, we are deeply concerned because the citizens of the state recently selected a territorial representative who is a Democrat. And the legislature in control of Colorado at the time was controlled by Republicans who were worried that the fragile status of Reconstruction would end if Rutherford Hayes would not be elected as president. And so the state legislature in Colorado said, given the extraordinary circumstances here, we were just admitted as a new state, we are going to pick three presidential electors ourselves and not send it to the people for a popular vote. And sure enough, those three were decisive in allowing Hayes to win the presidential election. Now, it would be a dramatic departure if the state legislature chose so, but we can look no farther than back than 2000. As the state of Florida was mired in several weeks of a recount between Al Gore and George Bush. 
And there was a worry that there would be insufficient time to figure out which slate of presidential electors would win. And the state of Florida and the legislature were mobilizing, preparing to enter a special session to select their own slate of presidential electors, regardless of what the people selected. But once the Supreme Court spoke, the state legislature needed to take no such extreme measures. Even with the decision to hold this vote, however, you and I are not voting for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or Gary Johnson or Jill Stein. We are voting for a slate of electors pledged to support those candidates. In fact, there's another thing that could occur in this process. Those electors could vote for anyone they choose. See, in many states, there's a pledge you might take. And in a few states, there's a law that purports to say you must vote for the candidate you were pledged to support. But it's not clear that your presidential candidates are supposed to be mechanical actors. The framers' vision was that we would select slates of individuals who would take their time to select candidates who they thought would best govern the country and not simply be the kind of knee-jerk, reactionary, mechanistic individuals who would intervene in this political process. And in the event that even just a few electors failed to select the preferred candidate, the majority. And there are three choices who fail to reach a majority of the electoral college votes. The House could look at its options among the top three vote getters and choose among those three, even if it's not the person who received the most votes in the electoral college. You see, it's not immediately obvious that the result would have to go to the winner of the electoral college. If you have three candidates, none of whom have a majority, it goes to the House. And at that point, well, we could have the election of 1824 all over again, where the House chooses someone who is not the top vote getter in the Electoral College. Now, I hope to suggest that our system of governance need not be overwhelmingly obsessed with direct democracy. Indeed, the framers considered many mixed forms of government, of direct and indirect democracy. And when we get to the form of election today, there are many steps we could take as voters. There are steps that can be taken in the legislature. There are steps that might occur when the electoral college meets in late December or when Congress meets in early January that might change who the president of the United States might be from the expectation that it's simply is a choice of the will of the voters in all of these elections. It might be the case that elections like this one, 2016, reflect some of the downsides of what Elbridge Gerry termed an excess of democracy. He was a representative from Massachusetts who refused to sign the Constitution, and he later served as James Madison's vice president. It's true. All forms of government have their weakness. And direct democracy is no different in its form of weakness. There are deep concerns from indirect democracy and the lack of responsiveness that have occurred in our forms of government. But we may have lost some of the wisdom of the framers when we shifted away from these mixed systems and toward the increasingly homogenous view that the popular majority controls. It might have come out some of the deliberation or the differing perspectives that we might have secured from alternative forms of government. Indeed, if I raise the suggestions that I floated, which are wholly consistent with our constitutional regime, regime, state legislatures picking electors, electors exercising their independent judgment, the House selecting a candidate who is not the leading vote getter in the Electoral College, I'm quite late, likely to face shock and outrage from those of us who are used to thinking of elections as one form of governance alone. But perhaps this journey through history has offered a bit of perspective that mingling and mixing our forms of government might be beneficial. In our presidential election this year, we have experienced perhaps some of the faults from excessively direct democracy. Perhaps we would still accept this system, warts and all, over some of the problems that might come from indirect democracy, lack of responsiveness, cronyism, and so on. But we have other examples we can look to, more controversial, more obscure certainly, but perhaps this year, perhaps something worth considering. Thank you.